it's the market's come a long way since I guess the end of 2021. And I think 2024 is going to be, sorry, end of 2022 and 2024 is going to be quite an interesting year. But I think it's not as clear as how I saw the year last year, how I saw 2023. So there's a few things that need to be ironed out with, um, you know, sentiment is starting to change and people are starting to get off the, the fence of the bear side and step back on into the middle of the fence and perhaps start to edge back into bullish sentiment. So um that's always a little bit of a worry but i think things are lining up quite nicely to have a bit more of a smoother year than what we've seen since 2021 when the fed started tightening so ted man uh speaking about the fed and tightening and all that stuff the market's currently pricing in the first cut to be uh in march right and so really the only data point that i can extract as far as price action going into the halving would be 2016, right? Where we had a huge pump going into the halving, right? I think Ethereum um, pumped from like 80 cents or a dollar all the way up to 25 short or the halving. And then right after the halving happened, uh, the whole market had a pretty sharp correction. I believe BTC pulled back 30, 35%, man. So that's sort of where my head is at as far as like, you know, rate cuts and all of those things happen. But I know you had posted uh, your themes for 2024. And, you know, I'll be honest with you, I didn't read through it. I, I, I kind of wanted to, you know, get the word directly from the horse's mouth uh, from you here on the show. So we can touch upon uh, that if you'd like, brother, to start off. Yeah, for sure. I'll um, speak about the rate cuts and what I think is going to happen this year with regards to what the Fed do with their monetary policy, because obviously they've been tightening for the best part of almost two years now, and they're finally on hold. So I think that's where they'll remain this year. I don't see the case for rate cuts yet at all, because you've got growth quite stable and actually trending higher throughout 2023, which no one predicted. And you've got um, employment quite steady. So there's no reason for them to cut or to stimulate the economy in any way. Everything's quite rosy at the moment. It's that Goldilocks scenario where um, we, we actually have had a soft landing, whether you want to deny it or not. That's where we are at the moment. So we are in, in saying that, we are yet to really feel the full impact of that two years of tightening. I think things will slow down this year, but still remain quite stable to the point where the Fed don't really have to do anything. Um, we're so used to them. Every meeting, what are they going to do? Well, you know, monetary policy was the most exciting thing for the last two years, which is usually never the case. Monetary policy is quite boring. But um, this year, I think we'll go back to that uh, macro is quite boring and things are just steadily ticking along. Yeah, we might see inflation tick a little bit higher. I think that's the real risk this year because we're coming out of 2023 where the base effects of 2022, 2021, having such high inflation prints, those year-on-year -year numbers came in drastically lower last year. But we're going to have to start comparing last year's numbers to this year's numbers, and that's where we might see those baseline effects start to have a little bit of a negative impact with regard to inflation printing a little bit higher this year but i don't think it's going to get to the levels where it's a concern for the fed we saw today um three month annualized inflation the headline reading print the lowest since 2020 so that's really the number that i watch um if you're looking at inflation look at the three month annualized to get it to get a gauge of where the fed are watching they're not going to be looking at what's inflation now compared to a year ago they want to see that short-term trend is it trending higher do we need to do something or is it okay so at the moment inflation's in a good spot um growth's in a good spot employment's in a good spot so there's no case i think that march pricing for the first rate cut is totally off off the ball off the um off target and you probably won't see any rate cuts this year unless that data really starts to to change and we see some negative um inflation prints you know inflation printing higher growth starting to trend lower um yeah i, I think it's totally off the mark so uh, outside of like uh some fed talk man we can kind of dive deeper into uh the crypto landscape man i know you're uh, a pretty huge solana bull man and a thesis that i'm currently coming up with as far as the etf narrative is all right we've got 
Bitcoin spot ETF out of the way. Then there's Ethereum. And the next step after that, man, and I've talked about this on the show over the last couple of months, is that at some point, brother, I think that there's going to be an ARK Invest version uh, of an ETF comprised of a basket of digital goods, right? BTC, ETH, Solana, and perhaps something uh, like a Celestian, man. And truth be told, man, something like that, plus um, I, I believe uh, Circle registered for an IPO, we're kind of seeing some top signals uh, for this cycle um, you know, come to fruition, right? I believe in 2020, Coinbase filed uh, for their IPO, and the market is giving you <laughs> future top signals in advance. Of course, you know, we'll have Ty Lopez come out with a new scam probably as well uh, <laughs> to begin to signal the top as well. What, what are your thoughts on, on, uh, on something like that um, occurring as far as the ETF narrative goes, man? These things tend to happen you know, close to the Pico top of every cycle happened in 2017, happened in 2021 with the IPOs. And now it's like, all right, what's the next step uh, after all those things? Yeah, um, you make a good point. Um, I think the greatest top signal so far, the one with the highest hit rate, I think it's got 100% in terms of hit rate was Coinbase getting to the top of the Apple App Store. So I'm not sure where we are now, but I think you want to keep an eye on that. As far as IPOs, um, yeah, Circles just announced that they're going to be um, looking to do an IPO sometime this year, I believe. So things like that, yeah, previously they've been, been tops, but I think it depends on your time frame. So are you an investor that's day trading? Are you an investor that's got uh, the next decade in mind? If you're an investor that's got the next decade in mind, all of these things are quite bullish. So institutional adoption it, it strays away from the original vision of crypto but in a world where capitalism is king and you know ca capital flows um are the things that drive these these markets higher that's what we want in its purest most basic form you want more money into this market so you've seen that with gold um back in 2004 when etfs were approved in the us ever since it's been basically up only until that asset class has got to a level where it's quite mature now and the banks basically run those markets and move it how they want and, and don't really care for higher prices so much. So that's become quite a range bound market, but eventually Bitcoin's going to end up in the same basket as something like gold. And that's going to take, you know, we've got ETFs now, but that's going to take, you know, 10 to 15 years for it to truly evolve into the behemoth that is uh, that it could be something like gold and something that every um, everyone has in their their pension fund. Everyone's um, diversifying their portfolios with digital assets. So if we are truly going to move into an asset class that is for all, we have to have these events take place. They might be top top signals in the short term because that maximum euphoria in that moment is reached, and, and people are like, "All right, what's next?" There's not much there's not much in the short term so i'm going to sell my bags or there's people that were positioned before the event it's just that whole short term ebbing and flowing of position making position taking um, and closing out profit so yeah i think it's very much just dependent on on your time frame we saw that only two years ago ftx blew up ftx was supposedly the greatest thing for crypto at the time it brought a lot of new money to the space but it blew up reset the market and now we've got a new narrative um so with an asset class that's so immature um that's going to continue to be a, a feature of the market and, and not so much a bug until we reach levels um, like we're starting to to tease with institutional adoption in the us and around the world so tldr i think it's quite quite powerful that there's so much interest from institutions at the moment but with that comes um a greater ebbing, ebbing and flowing of those take profit, open position um, dynamics where cycles might begin to become quicker or we might not even have, have cycles at all anymore. So Bitcoin as it was is probably not going to be Bitcoin as it is post um, ETFs, but I think it's 
quite powerful that we're seeing so much interest in this asset class. Do you think it would make the case that perhaps, you know, we we re not only exceed all time highs a lot quicker, right? Where there is before, uh, usually for halvings, we would have to wait about six to seven months post having for us to eclipse um, having. So there's that, right? The potential that, all right, if this time is truly different, right? And all this money's coming in, perhaps we could see something like a Q1 uh, all-time high break for both BTC and also Ethereum, right? With that getting started on uh, multiple uh, spot ETF baskets and also the time for the cycles, right? Typically, we have about 18 months after having to extract as much value from this uh, market as possible when we factor in a upside uh, volatility, right? But if we're going to be having a consistent TWAP, uh, across all majors in this asset class, you know, one could say, as you said, this would break the four-year cycle. And Max has also uh, gone this at length, where perhaps we go into uh, Suzu's fabled super cycle, right? <laughs> perhaps he was uh, one cycle uh, early, right? He was a little bit too early on that one. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, we could, like, with regard to your point about Q1, BTC hitting all-time highs. I don't see why that would be off the table. That's very possible, given everything that's happening. It's just a matter of um, does BlackRock want that to happen? Does do the BTC Wales want that to happen? Um, we're at, we're at the hands of much higher powers than um, we have been previously. So it comes down to that. All that you can do is try and follow the trend and, and get the best entry that you can and, and take profits where you think. It is the best spot to take profits um, and hopefully you get another entry to ride it higher. But I think, yeah, cycles could become a lot quicker than what they have done previously, given um, the inflows, what we saw ETFs today do $2 billion and break a few records. Um, and now those asset managers are going to have to go out and source some Bitcoin to, to fill up those ETFs, given the demand. So yeah, it's going to be a crazy few months. And if we do see these ETFs really take a hold of the market, I think things will happen a lot quicker than they do um, more slowly. And I think just to, to tag on a little bit of monetary policy stuff, it, it comes down to one, monetary policy, is there cheap money around? Is there going to be cheap money around or are we tightening up shop? That's always going to affect these markets um, and has done so since about 2020 when COVID popped off and maybe even a little bit earlier. But as the asset class matures, it's going to become one big trade, just like most other markets. If there's cheap money around, prices go up. If there's more expensive money, if things are becoming harder, prices go down. Um, and Bitcoin is has been the first to catch on to that and queue into that. And that's been the case we saw as soon as the Fed announced tightening in, I think it was around August, they teased it. And then by November that they locked in, yet we're starting to tighten in 2022. Um, they announced in 2021, <clears throat> Bitcoin straight off the highs um, quite rapidly and stocks were a little bit more resistant and the bond market <clears throat> was the same. So it might become a little bit slower to price these things in because you've got larger, larger money managers managing their positions in Bitcoin and maybe they're a bit more hesitant to, to weigh up the situation and slower to react. Um, whereas in crypto at the moment, we're quite quick to press a red or a green button um, and, and, and change things up. So it's <clears throat> going to become a more range-bound market, I think. The, the law of diminishing gains is very much starting to take a shape at the market. But with that, I think these ETFs are quite exciting in the way that it might become a gateway drug to altcoins, um, you know, get a taste of holding Bitcoin and see the gains that you may or may not make doing that. And then, you know, your, your curiosity expands to the altcoin market. And I think that is something also that will be quite exciting about these ETFs and about the whole marketing campaign behind the ETFs. Um, and it, it also just to tag on one last thing in the whole, is this market going to change or is it going to stay the same? I think, human nature and human behavior is one thing that will remain consistent throughout all of this. So 
people are going to be euphoric when they're making a lot of money. People are going to be in despair when they're losing a lot of money and be forced sellers or forced buyers um, or be curious about opening or closing a position. So throughout the cycles, if they get quicker or shorter, the, the patterns are probably going to remain quite similar with um, you know, people aping in at the top and losing a lot of money when things go down and then um, the smarter people or the more um, knowledgeable or more experienced people cleaning up at the bottom and then making a whole heap of money selling, pe selling to people that were late at the top. So that's um, something that's going to be consistent. So you can apply that across all markets. Um, the only nuances, I guess, is that monetary policy and narrative specific to that market. So right now I've got the ETF, then you've got the halving, but what's next? If we get monetary policy shifting in favour of the bulls, then that's going to continue prices higher. But if we don't get anything after that, you might get a little bit of profit taking. That's the way I, I, I tend to see it. So, um, yeah. But I think we're in a good spot at the moment for, for BTC and risk assets in general. Ted, you, you know, when we look at things like monetary policy and how that could affect uh, the broader market, right? You know, but before we would look at crypto, you know, in 2022 specifically, like, man, you know, crypto is not going to go up there if there is no QE, if rates aren't low. But the fact of the matter is, man, over the last couple of quarters, right, Tether has basically been doing on-chain QE. And more recently, USDC has been printing money as well. And I know uh, you're an individual that likes to use AI and all that sort of stuff. And there's this chart that you've been posting over the last, you know, one or two quarters talking about uh, crypt crypto delta liquidity, right? And we're now at a spot where we're starting to see actual new inflows, right? So going into this year, right, we've got a massive election. And if we if we're paying attention to what the market is telling us, and usually the market has been right when it comes to these massive things, whether it's rate hikes, rate cuts, uh, even things like CPI, right? I know today we missed a print, but as you said, it's it's somewhat of a nothing burger. And currently right now, right, uh, when it comes to the elections, it really seems that we're more than likely going to be having an, an administration that is more um, pro-growth, right? And more in-house infrastructure, everything being built in America, uh, by in America and for America, right? So everything in-house and you know that's pretty good for growth right that's pretty good for your low cap stocks for the consumer all that stuff so if, if we're pricing that in right do you think there's a case to be made that perhaps we would see interest rates going back down to near zero right and perhaps even even a few rounds of easing right and it's just some dubious speculation on my part but if we factor in okay First, we have on-chain QE with Tether printing billions. Now we have this ETF, which is sort of this quasi-QE going on uh, for uh, for crypto. And the next step would be, all right, let's stimulate all markets because you know the way things are going with rates this high, something's got to give. Within the next 12 months, something's got to give. And perhaps there's a case to be made uh, for at least two to three quarters of easing uh, sometime in the next, like, 18 months or so just just going off of uh what's what's um happened in the past yeah so i think with what's going on on chain with tether usdc even maker as well with their die stablecoin um they're having to compete with traditional markets with regards to generating yield on their product so in traditional markets, you've got government bonds that, that are paying out, you know, 5%, um, even a little bit more at the moment. But you've, then you've got on-chain, which in 2021, people were making 20% or more, obviously, with some Ponzi's that have now blown up. But that was an easy advertisement for people to deposit money on-chain. And that's why we saw such large inflows and stablecoin supplies explode in 2020, 2021, because um, holding money in savings accounts in treasuries was, you know, worthless. There's no point because you weren't generating any income on it. Um, but depositing that, depositing that in crypto, you could hold a stable coin and earn 
um, 10, 20, 30 percent or do yield farming or something like that, and then 50 percent or more um, delta neutral. So that's that was quite a crazy um, reality at the time. And people were happy to deposit money on chain. And with that, USDT has to, to print more stable coins and USDC, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the dynamic we saw back then. In 2022, however, we saw rates in the traditional world start to really ramp up um, like they never had done before. So money moves out of crypto, which now has a whole bunch of Ponzi's that, that have blown up. And rates in crypto, I don't know, they might have been 2 or 3% if you're holding stable coins on exchanges or on chain, which was not competing at all with the 5 6% we saw in traditional markets. So logically, you move money out of crypto into traditional markets, lower risk. Your money's not controlled by some anon devs. It's controlled by your bank or the US government or whatever government it may have been. And you're sitting your money there and you're earning it. No risk, just sitting there earning a yield. So that's where we moved to after that um, craziness of 2021. But now here we are where stable coins are coming back. We're seeing a lot of um, printing with Tether, USDC Maker. And that has come about because they've started to increase their the, the yield on their products. So I think Maker were the first ones to start because you saw DAI really ramp up high at the, the the middle of 2023 and then the others have caught up so tether now um if i can get it up on my computer quickly but tether usdc they're all offering around four to five to six percent for holding their product and, and staking it or, or locking it up or whatever their their um their product is, is doing so that's why i think Stable coins are coming back and we're seeing a lot of printing, but also you're seeing people more comfortable to to get back into crypto with the advent of ETFs, some regulatory clarity, and obviously prices go up. People want to be involved, right? So that is what you're seeing there. And it's just a matter of competition. So if Maker ups their rate, you're going to see more printing by more printing of the DAI token because people want to have a higher rate. And the same is said for USDC or Tether. Um, it's just a, a competition thing. So I think that will continue to be a feature of this market where people are chasing that, that higher yield, higher rate on their stable coin and whoever can win that battle will win the, the market share. So that's, that's quite an interesting development. And in a, in a world with high inflation, high rates, um, you know, they're going to have to start to, to really push the penny to to attract more flows to attract more flows to their specific coin and that in itself is bullish for crypto i think so yields in traditional markets have topped out um you know they're not going to go any higher your saving accounts are probably not going to generate any more um income for you than they are currently so people eventually look to somewhere else and crypto is going to be that answer i think um throughout 2024 when that realization comes about yeah and and speaking of like other stable coins and all that stuff um i know there's this one project that uh arthur hayes has been talking about and it's also backed by kobe called uh athena labs and their stable coin is called us usde and there's currently just over a hundred million dollars has been printed so far year to date and they're doing something uh with bonds and all that stuff i haven't really looked into it that deeply but you know the, the case for stables definitely marks an, an, an intriguing inflection point and i think sometime in this cycle we're going to see uh the total market cap for all stables eclipsing one trillion and i think that's probably a metric that we're going to be overheated near the top, right? Similar to last cycle, right? Where once BTC crossed the trillion dollars in market cap, that was pretty much most of the upside that was done, right? By the time BTC eclipsed 60,000, most of everything had already topped out unless you were in some gaming metaverse stuff or in some of these L ones, right? But I, I want to get in touch uh, with you, man, as far as like, some narratives right so when we look at 2023 we can comprise it in two halves right the first half was you know 
the AI stuff, right? Uh, Fetch went crazy. Um, and then, of course, L2 season, right? We saw uh, things like the Optimism ecosystem, the Arbitrum ecosystem. We saw Injective uh, doing quite well the first half. And then the second half was more on-chain, right? Started with Rollbit, Unibot, all that stuff on Ethereum. And then towards Q4, we practically had a melt-up. Right, we had some proof of work stuff like uh, like Caspa doing quite well that second half of uh, last year. Uh, we had some newer projects, right, like Say Network with parallelized EVMs. Perhaps that's a precursor to things like Monad, right? The whole market is going crazy over Monad, even though the token might not be out for like a year, a year plus, right? Uh, we have modularity, right, with Celestia, so. The market is still going with this huge rotation narrative and all those things, man. I don't know you're a proponent of Solana, right? I, I believe you tweeted out anytime we made a new year to date high, you're like Solana at XX price is a superior L1 to everything else <laughs> compared to when it was trading at $200, right? Yeah. And myself and Max, uh, we actually made a video on our YouTube kind of going through a comprehensive deep dive on how Solana um, might perform, right? Because in September, we were sort of at an, at, at an inflection point, right? Even though we had saw Solana rally from $8 to $31, it was 50% off of the highs. And we were hearing, you know, two sides of the camp. Is this going to be NEO, right? Where you know, it was the baby of a cycle. And then all it did was make a macro high, right? And a double top on USDT uh, valuation, right? But at the same time, right, around that time in August, September, coming off of that, uh, you know, hyper speculative bubble of, you know, the on-chain rotation on ETH, it was like, all right, like, we know Ethereum can't really be sustainable for all these newcomers what's the next thing it has to be soul right we've got all these developments with marginfly um jupiter and really like almost every single narrative that happened in 2023 started on solana and mind you uh for the people listening we aren't you know sponsored by solana labs we're not telling you to buy solana or anything like that but really all the narratives that sustain 2023 whether it's uh, memes, whether it's uh, gaming, uh, whether it's gambling, or whether it's you know EVM, right? With things like Neon, it all started on Solana, right? That that's that that's where I'm kind of coming back with this. So, you know, Solana has made the case last year that it's more than likely going to be the L1 from that L1 basket from 2021 that ends up making marginal highs especially against ethereum um i believe the soul eth pair has continued to smash uh all-time highs against its ethereum pair up until like a week or two ago but either way it's made the case uh through of course price action development and of course more more like granular details i believe uh as far as dex activity solana broke its 2021 all-time high and actually had more activity um on its native chain compared to Ethereum. So, you know, we've wrapped up 2023 as far as narratives go, right? But for you specifically, Ted, what are you eyeing for this year as far as crypto specific narratives outside of uh, the ETF, right? Is it crypto gaming? Is it AI? Uh, is it modularity? Is it parallelized EVMs, brother? W would love to know uh, that side of uh, your analysis, man. Yeah, for sure. I think. My approach now is very different to what it was back in 2020 or even 2019 and 2021, um, where, you know, there were so many things to look at in crypto. It was almost like anything went up and there was just so much money flowing about, which I'm not saying this time is going to be different, but learning from that and trying to chase every single narrative um, and trying to get a piece of the pie of everything was no way to maximize performance during that period. If you're trying to do that, I think those, I think GCR said it actually, or someone might've said it before him, but he said, um, those who chase two rabbits will never catch one, like something like that. Um, so if you're chasing all these different things, you're never fully going to maximize that performance. Um, so for me, it's as simple as BTC and Solana at the moment. Um, Solana, I've been quite vocal about it since, well, I don't know, 
since 2021, really, um, which got me into a little bit of trouble when it started, when FTX went down. But um, having that conviction at the bottom has well and truly made up for that. So I think with Solana, the thing is when you compare it to, to other things that are available or other cycles or previous cycles, it's a little bit off the mark because it's a little bit different to what's existed before. So we're seeing the developer adoption um, and, and commits on something like GitHub are just through the roof, even when compared with Ethereum. Um, if you're comparing apples for apples, it's it's insane to see because nothing has ever challenged Ethereum in that way. Um, and with all of these layer twos, um, modularized EVMs, parallelized EVMs, or I'm sorry, I haven't been keeping up with all of that, but I think it's clear that um, people don't want to use Ethereum. And the feedback is when someone goes from Ethereum to Solana is that why the hell would I ever go back to Ethereum when I've used Solana? The thing that's keeping most people from making that leap is that there's just so much money on Solana at the moment, uh, on Ethereum at the moment when you compare it with Solana. So until you see that that shift in maybe money on either chain or total value locked on either chain become within reach of one another um, that leap is still going to be a little bit difficult for most people so if you're developing a token on solana you're like oh you know do i develop it on solana or eth because eth has so much more capital locked away on that chain i'm going to be able to capture more more flows into my project, into my token. Whereas if you're on Solana, um, it's a little bit more difficult. And hey, it might be more uh, powerful or cheaper or, um, you know, just a little bit easier to develop on and maybe have a bit of a brighter future. But money is king in, in this space. Um, and that's going to be, remain the way until the end of time, probably. But the point being is that Ethereum has still got the majority of that layer one, it's definitely got the majority of that layer one market share. And Solana, yeah, it's capturing a little bit, but it's nowhere near the the point where people go, all right, um, you know, there's not too much, there's not too many more benefits developing on Ethereum than there is Solana. So I'm going to go on Solana. We're not quite there yet. We need to see some more bridging over to Solana um, which we are seeing, we're seeing stable coin supplies on Solana um, grow quite, quite nicely, but that needs to continue to be the theme. And if that can remain consistent throughout 2024, eventually we're going to get a, to a point where Ethereum, is, it doesn't make too much sense to develop on Ethereum anymore. And you're going to look at cheaper, quicker um, layer ones. And Solana is definitely there leading the way with that. Um, layer twos, they're just forking at ETH and um, band-aiding, you know, something that's been developed um, well, almost 10 years now, been, been around for almost 10 years. But it's the classic like um, Microsoft and Apple or we've seen this happen so many times where, you know, you've got a good thing and then something better comes along and, and takes um, some market share away. So I think that's where Solana's moving. That's why I bet on it and the Bitcoin obviously is just a no brainer at the moment. Um, chasing other things. I think some plays like Jupiter is definitely one um, with the airdrop. That's one I won't, won't be selling. That's for sure. Um, Jupiter is going to scale with Solana. I think quite nicely. They're, um, you know, using Jupiter after using something on ETH or using anything else on Solana. Like it's just such a beautiful application. Um, and it's only getting better. Um, then you've got all of these other things. If you if you look at how Ethereum evolved and the apps that were developed on Ethereum and translate that to Solana, you're seeing similar things pop up on Solana now. So if you can map out what Ethereum did and what Solana is doing now, you can probably predict a little bit of a future as to where Solana is going to go. And Solana is probably going to do it a bit quicker and with a bit more uh, volatility than what ETH did just because of the maturity of the market and people are a little bit more clued in to, to crypto and how things move now. Um, so I think if you can map those two together and kind of project that into the future, you're going to do quite well. Ted, do you think there's a possibility for this cycle to have some 
to, to have some seasoning from the 2016 2017 cycle and what i mean by that is you know going into the tail end of that cycle right a lot of people were crazily bullish on not only proof of work assets but quote unquote eth killers right and of course alternative payment options as well and xrp towards the last few months of the bull run actually flipped eth for like a day and that marked the exact top of total crypto market cap in early january of uh, 2018 shortly before bitconnect went to zero and my dubious speculation mind you this is dubious speculation should not be taken as uh, financial advice or even you know remotely seriously but you know cycles they do tend to rhyme right they don't really repeat one to one but they do tend to rhyme and my dubious speculation is that solana at some point in this cycle post having is going to steal a lot of uh, market share from eth and I do think Soul ETH is going to continue to trend on a macro time frame. And I think there's a case to be made where Soul actually flips ETH uh, to mark the exact top uh, of this cycle. And, you know, truth be told, man, we're now seeing Solana being showcased on national TV as the top three assets, right? Before it was just Bitcoin, right? And then it became Bitcoin and ETH. And now it's Bitcoin, ETH, and Solana. And I think Solana is definitely, um, well, not definitely, but is starting to earn its place uh, as, that, as that apex asset where, all right, we've had the smart contract playground test with ETH. Now let's build the next thing. Let's build on top of that uh, narrative and make it better. Now that we've had a few years to test the grounds to see what works, what doesn't, and kind of add our own flavor to it, right? Um, a lot of devs actually come from uh, developing Rust and not so much Solidity and all that stuff. So from like a traditional coding's perspective, people are more, from 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 like the coding space, they're more like prune to go over to Solana rather than just Ethereum and deal with like all the complexities with L2s and all that stuff. And there's even things like, L3s right now. And I kind of think that that side of the crypto space is just getting way too far ahead of itself, man. I believe there's like two dozen, close to two dozen L2s now on ETH. And yeah, it, it really shouldn't be uh, that dilutive, man, um, to be honest. So what are your thoughts on that, brother, when it comes to uh, dubious speculation uh, for this cycle, when it comes to uh, the soul valuation? Yeah, it's crazy. I can't believe there's so many layer twos. Like it, to me, that just says one thing that people don't want to use ETH. Um, and Solana, like, so if we break it down to its most simple component, just before I get to price um, predictions or, or speculation, I think, um, so why do people want to use layer ones? They want to transfer money they want to bet on shit coins. They want to do some DeFi farming um, or something in DeFi. So what do they want? They want that to happen fast. They want it to be cheap and they want to, you know, participate with the largest sums of money as possible. Um, and, and it's simple, uh, fundamental. That's what people want to do. And we saw yesterday as ETH started to ramp, gas prices went up to, I don't know, there was something I wasn't sure. I'm not sure what the way was, but I saw someone post a screenshot of $60 to send $100 in US dollars in USDT. Sorry. So that is just not sustainable and it's not going to be sustainable when um, the masses come back and start punting on shit coins on Ethereum. They're going to be like, what the hell is this? This is just stupid. So they're going to look for an alternative. Um, and we're already seeing that, that Solana is happily accepting those flows and, doing what layer ones are supposed to do is just transact in the most fast and cheapest way. Um, and you can argue that security is a concern, but Solana is catching up with regards to the number of nodes and they've got finance coming out at the end of the year. Like things are very much on the up there. So that's the way I look at it. What do people want to do? They want to transact fast and cheaply and um, get things done on layer ones. They don't really care so much for security or, um, you know, you've got Bitcoin for that. You've got Bitcoin is storing a value, locking away um, funds. 
however you want to do so. So if you pair Bitcoin and Solana together, it's probably a pretty good duo to um, to just interact with crypto in general. Um, as far as price targets, I'm um, pulling up the Sol ETH chart now. Obviously, it depends on this ETF. If this ETF goes through for ETH, which it's highly likely that it does, um, that narrative needs to play its um, play its course. Go and you're going to see just like Bitcoin pricing into this ETF ahead of time, which we're seeing now. And eventually that's going to have a Bitcoin moment where, okay, the ETH ETF is approved. What's next? And the market shifts its attention to what's next. And that could be a Solana ETF. Who knows? Um, one of the themes for this year was the year of the, well, my themes was um, some speculation that there could be altcoin ETFs pop up now that we've had a precedent of Bitcoin being approved, you know, these fund managers are going to, you know, they're going to be drooling at the opportunity to offer more crypto products and, and make more fees um, for their companies. So if this Bitcoin ETF goes well, we've seen a very hot first day, but if that can be sustained, these fund managers, these big funds, uh, BlackRock, v Vanguard, even eventually, um, Arc, Arc invests. These guys are going to be pushing as hard as they can to get more and more crypto products because clearly there's demand for it. So, like I said, the gateway drug to crypto, to on chain, to altcoins, is the are these BTC ETFs. Um, that's very much my view. So, you know, ETH is going to play its course. It's going to price in this ETF. If that does or doesn't come, it'll probably top out there, and then you'll see Solana probably take shape again and push into the highs and really get regain whatever it may have lost through this period of the, the ETF, um, the ETH ETF being priced in. So, um, you know, as far as a Pico top with Sol rotating above ETH, um, very much possible. That's a bit too far ahead for me to say yes or no, or, but you know, it's anything, if we've learned anything over the last couple of years is that anything is possible in crypto. But one thing I do see happening is that consistent narrative of moving away from ETH and moving into something else. And Solana is very much there waiting to take those flows that come out of ETH. Ted, and, you know, going deeper into this cycle, uh, what other narratives are you looking outside of uh, of L1? I know you're pretty heavy into things like AI. So are you looking at AI? Are you looking at gaming? What other sectors are you um, looking at specifically, right? Don't want to get uh, too diluted in this market, uh, as you mentioned. Yeah, I think just mentioning gaming first, I don't... Yeah, I see it's cool and um, fun to have games on the blockchain, but... Is it really going to take take over from what is offered already traditionally? Getting paid to, to play, um, you know, who's paying you? At the end of the day, it's token holders um, in, in most instances, but it's dressed up as crypto gaming. And yeah, I, I don't see it taking off. Just like the metaverse, it's a cool idea, but um, maybe I'm not, not getting something or I'm missing something, but I don't see that really being a utility for crypto. In the long term, AI is um, a little bit similar, um, but it comes down to tokens that are able to generate revenue and generate um, and, and give that back to their token holders. What's the real use case for these tokens? So previously, it may have been speculation on something that was going to happen, like um, Cardano maybe is one of the good examples, or Hex that were valued at just insane valuations before they even released something. So those tokens have shown the path for these other tokens that um, may not may promise of the world and not deliver so much. Unibots um, and these other bot tokens that are actually sharing the revenue, um, it's a lot easier to value those tokens and to, to really gain an understanding of what's in it for the token holders. Um, so projects like that that are able to generate revenue and give that revenue share back to their holders that's a real um, investment or um, that's a real use case for a token in crypto. Um, you know, you got to be careful, obviously, with what jurisdiction you're in. And in many ju jurisdictions, that's not um, legal. So there's that to be take, 
uh, to take into account. But I think if you're looking at a token and, and looking to invest in a token, sure, you can do your technical analysis. But at the end of the day, what is that token doing for its holders? If it's not doing anything, there's no point holding it. But if it's doing something like giving you a return or um, you're able to use it for a product or you're able to um, stake those tokens and, and generate some kind of income or utility, that's a token that you probably want to be holding. Um, and there's many of those. You've just got to seek them out and do your due diligence. Um, so for me, that's the core of what I think about when I think about altcoins or holding a token in general. So I don't really see a whole heap in the metaverse. Most of those tokens just dilute their holders. They'll, you know, you can stake in an income, but most of those rewards are, are paid in tokens and those tokens are sold to realize the real, real reward at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, for me, it's as simple as Jupiter, which will eventually be, um, giving profit back to their well, protocol revenue back to their holders in some kind of way. So that's one to hold on to into the future. And I think that really has the ability to scale with something. So something similar to Uniswap on ETH, but even bigger. Um, and then, sorry, just looking at something on Twitter and then um, Solana and Bitcoin. So for those three at the moment, keeping it simple um, are the ones for me because Spreading my bets is one time consuming. You've got to keep up with each project, what they're doing, every intricacy of it. And then two, it's, um, you know, why bet on something that's outside of my core belief and my core research when I can bet on those things that I'm truly um, convinced are going to do something for my portfolio. Yeah, I definitely agree on like the dilution part, man. Uh, when it comes to things like metaverse or even attention, right? Even though uh, people like yourself and myself have been in this industry for years and years and years, it's so difficult to have a bandwidth where you're focused on, you know, 10 different ecosystems, right? And a few weeks ago, market bandwidth, as far as attention goes, got so expansive that people were betting on AVAX inscriptions out of everything, Ted. AVAX inscriptions, and I was just mind boggled, right? <laughs> like, I'm keeping it pretty simple this cycle, right? Uh, modularity and parallelized EVMs uh, slash L1s, right? With a sprinkle of of uh, of, uh, of gaming here and there, right? But outside of that, dude, like, you know, I know we have ordinals, right? Which is another crazy ecosystem in of itself. You now have bridging solutions right you're going to be able to bridge uh brc 20s into eth and vice versa there's some lending protocols it's kind of crazy right it's sort of like people are trying to take bitcoin uh, from like a proof of work asset uh, into this sort of ethereum based platform right and Man, I wonder how like the Bitcoin base layer is going to look um, a year from now, right? And I, I'd like to get I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts as well, dude. Like, do you think we're kind of experimenting way too much with Bitcoin and we should leave it enough as it is, or do you do you encourage like more dubious speculation um, like this? I know Taproot Wizards or they're doing a, a plethora of things when it comes to uh, quote unquote BTC DeFi. Yeah, um, it's like anything. It, capturing the new shiny thing is always attractive to to most investors uh, and grabs that short term attention, but it's quickly evaporated. Um, and you're seeing that with in the bear market. We were well, there. You go. There's a GCR quote. Sorry, going back to that. He who chases two rabbits catches neither. Yeah. Um, but going so these short term shiny toys that pop up. We saw it with. What was that friend tech or that social platform? Yeah, it was, it was, friend, yeah, friend tech, friend tech by Razor. Yeah. So I don't think that's doing a whole heap at the moment. I could be wrong, but that was something shiny that popped off for a, a month, maybe hamster racing in the depths of the bear. Um, that was crazy. So these things, uh, I put them all in the same basket, to be honest. It's just a short term attention grab. 
yeah, hey, they might deliver value and, like I said, deliver token value for their holders or deliver value to, value to their token holders, which is great. But um, eventually that attention goes away and things shift back to more infrastructure, what's actually going to scale with crypto, what's going to add value to the space um, perpetually. So things like Solana, things like BTC, obviously is going to stay there forever. And um, if you believe in an ecosystem that's going to scale with crypto, you want to be looking at those ecosystem tokens that, that are going to scale with um, that ecosystem. So simply that's how I see things. Um, that short-term attention grab is fun. Um, if you can capture it, it's great, but uh, it's more a hit and run type of play than it is something that I'd pay attention to um, over the long run. Ted, and, you know, speaking about attention grabbing and, you know, the market paying attention to, to a few projects, um, there's like three projects right now that have really captured the market's attention with tokens that aren't even out yet, right? You've got uh, Bear Chain, Monad, and uh, also Eigenlayer. Are any of these three projects under your radar or are you just, are you just looking at what's in front of you right now? Because, brother, I'll tell you what, man, I can't go through a single day on my timeline without, you know, seeing bear PFPs talk about bear chain and how it's going to be like sort of like Luna. Um, and, of course, Monad. I, I take Monad as essentially Solana with memes, right? And then Eigenlayer um, is essentially extracting more yield uh, off of your uh, staked Ethereum. Yeah, if we look at what happened um, last cycle, this cycle is probably going to happen a little bit quicker. But um, so you had obviously Bitcoin pump, Ethereum pump, everything pumped together. But then you had these projects pop up um, like Luna, like um, these yield farming protocols on Solana, like Tulip. Um, there's another one that escapes my, my mind at the moment. But these things are going to pop up um, while the market is hot. And I guess it's, up to us to decide whether this is going to to stay and scale with crypto scale with the ecosystems or if it's going to you know just be that short-term attention grab so these things are going to pop up um i haven't heard a whole heap about these other um what did you say eigen layer was it and monad yeah i i, I yes yeah, eigen layer and there's uh, a few billion dollars locked up um in 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 total eth locked so i believe mainnet is in q2 and the whole narrative around that is restaking right so essentially um i i would honestly say it's basically if, if i were to give a left curve answer it's basically imagine anchor protocol but instead of having you know crazy pondonomics it actually it's actually somewhat real right it's not guaranteed 20 percent. it's just you'll be able to earn more yield on your eth um through lending out that staked eth in a, in a, in in some strange and technical way i'm still trying to wrap my head around it right but there's another aspect of eigenlayer where they have data availability so it essentially kills off the idea of all these erc20 tokens right and it's it's a very speculative bet and you know perhaps it does become one of these projects that was marketed in 2020 2021 that end up doing quite well but just wanted to know your take because i know you're pretty active uh on the timeline and monad um one of the guys from jump uh crypto that's uh his project and kobe's uh also backing it up and all that stuff but it's basically off the backs of uh, a parallel EVM um, trying to scale out Ethereum as well in, in some fashion. There's 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 not even a white paper. That's the thing, right? Like, there's no white paper for Monad. There's no white paper for Bear Chain. It's sort of uh, more speculative in nature for now. But the amount of hype that I'm seeing on the timeline is uh, astronomical, and I kind of I kind of view this as how Celestia was around this time last year where the whole timeline's talking about Celestia, but the token's not even out for another year or so. Interesting. I'm just looking through their timeline now. Um, 
Cool. I'll have to look into it more because honestly, this is the first time I'm looking at eigenlayer. Um, but if it can do things that Ethereum can't and Solana can't, um, yeah, there's a place for it, I guess. Well, brother, man, uh, we are at the top of the hour. Uh, Tucker, if you want to say anything, feel free to do so. But if not, man, I think uh, this is a pretty solid place to wrap up, man. Ted, it was pretty uh, awesome having you on, man. It was great catching up after uh, about 10 months, man. So um, we'll catch up sometime post having perhaps in the summer once uh, this market gets rolling. And uh, hopefully we'll be uh, blasting through all time highs as we uh, get close to the ETH ETF, right? That's uh, the next narrative, man. Yeah, I appreciate you having me, Wabi. It's been a pleasure. I hope that we can do it again. No doubt, brother. Thank you guys so much. This is your first time listening. We're Because Bitcoin. Feel free to give us a follow to keep up with all of our shows here on X and on YouTube and all things like that. And uh, yeah, we'll see you tomorrow at 11 a.m. on YouTube for a market check. Feel free to follow Ted. And uh, truly, it was an honor, man. You can catch the replay on the highlights tab. Take care. God bless you. Bye-bye.